Good morning. Uh, I'm Matt Haller, IFA's president and CEO, and thank you all who have joined us for today's webinar to hear an update on the biopharmaceutical industry's commitment to beat COVID-19, therapeutics development, and how the franchise sector is working in collaboration with these manufacturers and others to promote vaccination to put COVID-19 in our rearview mirror. We have a number of great speakers lined up today, uh, but before I introduce them, I just wanted to make some brief uh, opening remarks. I think as uh, everybody knows, we've reached uh, a new phase uh, in the COVID-19 pandemic. And while we are hopeful we can see the light uh, at the end of the tunnel here, the Delta variant cannot be taken lightly. Uh, it is critical for all sectors of society to present a united front on the importance of vaccination and help return to the normalcy that we're all craving, including in our members' businesses. Uh, so it's particularly important to have this discussion now as the situation is evolving. And Mike from Pharma is gonna give us a few updates here in a minute. Uh, particularly in the wake of yesterday's CDC guidance on masks, uh, I'm really thankful to Pharma for allowing IFA to be a part of this conversation, uh, as well as bring in some perspective from uh, our members and what they're hearing uh, on the ground from employees and customers. Um, importantly, for the franchise sector, uh, it's clear that brands and especially franchising brands who are well known uh, can play a very important role in educating the public. So very grateful to Jenna Gent, of McDonald's for joining me today to share more about McDonald's efforts and their partnership with the Biden administration on vaccination. Before I pass the baton, I just want to talk quickly about the power of franchise brands, which I think is critical to understanding the role that we can play in generating scale to create awareness and information to both employees and our customers about the importance of getting the vaccine. Not only does franchising help drive the economy, but our brands are trusted messengers in their communities. According to a range of public opinion surveys, CEOs and importantly, our small business owners are more trusted voices on societal issues than politicians, government officials, and many others. With more than 700 franchise establishments across the country who support 7.6 million jobs, franchising has a strong role to play in this and other societal issues. Furthermore, according to surveys conducted by Morning Consult, more than 78% of Americans see franchises as an economic force in local communities, and 70% of Americans say franchises are a part of their everyday life. This gives franchising great power to be a deliverer of important societal messages, which is why we're so happy to partner with Pharma on this important topic. So now let me introduce our speakers and experts for today's event. First, we are going to hear from Dr. Mike Ibarra, Emergency Medicine Physician and Vice President of Medical Affairs and Strategic Alliances at Pharma. Mike will give us an update on what is happening in his industry and with the virus, as well as Pharma's efforts to coordinate with employer groups and the government. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Ebony Jade Hilton from the University of Virginia on the importance of understanding the long-term impact of COVID on individuals and the public. And finally, we will hear from Jenna Gent, Vice President of Government Affairs at McDonald's, IFA board member. Uh, Jenna will discuss how the franchise business sector can have an impact in this continued fight and some of the steps that McDonald's and her franchisees have taken uh, in this effort. So we expect to have plenty of time for questions. Uh, we have some that have already come in. Please use the chat feature in the app. And uh, with that, I will turn it over to Mike for uh, the beginning of our discussion. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, thank you so much, Matt. It's great to be with you, uh, as well as uh, my uh, friend and colleague from UVA. And it's nice to meet you, Jenna. So I'm excited that, that we could all be together. And, and this could not have been more of a timely topic. Um, when I heard about this, this event a few months ago uh, and we started planning for it, it seemed like maybe it wouldn't be uh, as hot of a topic. Uh, and of course, now uh, this is like a roller coaster that we're riding. And I think the main thing is we, we all have to put our seatbelts on and riding the roller coaster so that we can get through it safely. Um, so if you're able to go to the next slide, I can dive in um, to uh, my part of the presentation. 
Excellent. So Pharma, we're the trade association um, that represents the innovative biopharmaceutical industry. Our members include companies like Pfizer, uh, who, who have a vaccine that you may have heard of, Johnson & Johnson, um, other companies like Gilead that have invented new technologies to treat COVID-19. It's important to note that while things might feel similar today as they did last summer, um, the good news about COVID-19 is that right now it's now a preventable uh, illness and to the extent that we have vaccines that can prevent you from getting it and getting really sick. And then also it's a treatable illness. So those are two really big differences today um, than they were a year ago. Uh, if someone gets sick with COVID-19 and they come to the hospital and I see them, we have therapeutics that we can give them, whether that's the remdesivir medicine that I mentioned that Gilead invented or monoclonal antibodies uh, that are available to prevent you from getting sick and, and needing to be hospitalized. So even though, again, it might feel like we're in a similar spot as we were a year ago, um, things are actually very different from a, from a prevention and a treatment standpoint. We know what to do, we just have to do it. So if you can go to the next slide, There are three um, big things that I get a lot of questions about, uh, and I've been getting a lot of questions about in the last few few days, in the last few minutes, <laughs> even uh, from my colleagues. Uh, you know, where are we at with vaccines? What does that mean for these variants that I'm hearing about? And then finally, what do we know about booster shots? Um, so I'm going to tackle those one, two, three from from an industry perspective. If you go to the next slide, there are. Uh, there are currently three authorized vaccines in the United States, um, and they are using two of the three scientific approaches that you see here. Um, so there are two scientific approaches uh, that are being used. Uh, two of them are in play, uh, the, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. And then the middle one that you see there, that's the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. So for those of you that are, um, that are interested in this topic, but maybe didn't um, specialize in medicine like I did, um, or you, you don't have a scientific background, I'm gonna try and explain it in a way that, that hopefully makes sense. Uh, mRNA is sort of like a blueprint. It's a blueprint that tells your body how to recognize the tiny little spike protein on the outside of the virus. You can see the virus here on the left. It's a circle, you know, like a, like a, like a um, basketball that has these little spike proteins on the outside. And what the mRNA does is it teaches your body how to recognize these spike proteins. The spike proteins make the coronavirus unique. It's something very unique to this virus in particular that the flu virus doesn't have. So if we can teach the body to recognize the spike, then we can protect um, you from getting really, really sick with this vaccine. So mRNA is like a blueprint. What the middle row shows you that the Johnson & Johnson vaccine does is it actually does something similar, um, but it, it, it actually kind of encases the instructions or the blueprint uh, in a shell. Um, so it's almost like an orange, like you have a peel on the outside. You, you en encase that uh, in this shell, what we call an adenovirus vector shell. And it similarly teaches your body just to recognize the spike protein on the outside of the virus. In both of these situations, one of the most common questions we get is, can you get COVID-19 from the vaccine? And of course you can't because you're not getting exposed to the whole virus. You're just getting the instructions or the blueprint for the little spike protein on the outside of the virus. The third approach that's under development by companies, uh, actually one not too far from where I'm located, Novavax uh, is, is located in Rockville, Maryland, just a few miles up the road from where I'm at. Um, they are actually synthesizing the spike protein using insect cells or moth cells. They're making it uh, almost in test tubes and then they're amplifying it. They're making a lot of it and using that as the injection. So again, even with this approach, you're not getting the whole virus. You can't get COVID-19 from the vaccine. It's just teaching your body to recognize the spike protein and it's a really effective way of vaccinating. So if you go to the next slide, I kind of gave away some of the, the details here and I think that most of you probably know them. Um, we have three vaccines that are using two of those three scientific approaches to attack uh, COVID-19 and, and prevent it through vaccination. You've got Pfizer's vaccine that was authorized at the end of 2020. We have Moderna's vaccine also authorized at the end of 2020. And then the Johnson & Johnson single shot vaccine that was authorized in the spring of 2021. Um, but there are more vaccines coming, which is good because we need more people to be vaccinated here in the U.S., but also very importantly, we need more people vaccinated around the world. And some of these approaches are going to be really helpful in getting uh, other countries around the world vaccinated. Um, so, for example, AstraZeneca is being used very widely in other parts of the world. Um, Sanofi, one of our member companies, is working with GSK to develop a protein-based vaccine. And then Novavax, that company that I mentioned, they've put out... Um, 
uh, data just a, a little over a month ago, indicating their shot was very effective and they're going to seek authorization here, uh, I believe, in quarter three of 2021. So we've got plenty of supply in the U.S., um, but it's good to see other companies um, developing new vaccines so that we have enough supply for the whole world. Can we go to the next slide? Awesome. Uh, one of the things that we know uh, in, in taking care of patients, and I saw this very acutely, um, the really humbling reality of what we're living with, and I know there's a lot of concern uh, about, you know, what does it mean for me if I'm vaccinated right now? Um, unfortunately and sadly, almost all of the deaths that are occurring from COVID-19 right now are among unvaccinated individuals. Um, it is well over 97% of people that are dying from COVID-19 are unvaccinated. And that is a really sad truth because again, this is a preventable and treatable disease now. It's not the same as it was in July of 2020. Um, if you get the vaccine, your chances of getting really sick and needing to be hospitalized and certainly of death are substantially reduced. So it's really, really critical that we do everything we can to get vaccines um, out to the American public and around the world because it can prevent death. It's really, really important. You go to the next slide. Variants. We've all heard about these variants. I think Delta is now uh, the most common Greek letter referenced uh, in, in the American alphabet right now. Um, just recently, the World Health Organization moved from uh, talking about variants based on where we originally found them. Um, so we talked about the UK variant in the past or the South African variant in the past or the Indian variant in the past. And they've moved to talking about them in a Greek lettering system. And part of the reason for doing that is because these variants are not specific to country. Um, that just happens to be where they were first detected. We don't actually know where they arose from. That's just the country that first detected the variant. Um, so the World Health Organization now talks about um, variants in terms of Greek letters. So alpha corresponds to the variant that was first detected in the UK. Beta corresponds to the variant that was first detected in South Africa. Gamma, Brazil, Delta, India. The Delta variant is now dominant in the United States, and we're seeing significant uptakes of infection in parts of the country with lower vaccination rates. Uh, and we have a big enough reservoir of unvaccinated people in the US that it's causing significant surges in parts of the country. And unfortunately, it's almost like the reverse of herd immunity, where if we had had 99% of the population vaccinated, then likely all of us would be protected. Um, but there was a big enough pool of unvaccinated people that it's creating an uptick of infection. And then that infection is actually spilling over into vaccinated people and, and allowing some breakthrough infections to occur. So it's not that the vaccine is not working in vaccinated people. It's just that there are enough unvaccinated people where the virus is circling around that a certain percentage of vaccinated people are able to get infected. Remember, the vaccines are very effective upwards of 95% effective in the clinical trials, but that leaves 5% that could potentially get infection. And that's what we're seeing with these breakthrough cases. It's not indicating that the vaccines aren't working. It's just that we have so much disease circulating uh, that unfortunately we're seeing breakthrough cases. We do know that the vaccines are effective at preventing hospitalization, hospitalizations and death across all of the variants that we currently know about. But of course we need to tamp down on the amount of virus that's circulating because um, we're concerned about what future variants could look like. We need to make sure that we're preventing the virus um, from mutating further by getting more and more people vaccinated. Um, so everyone probably saw the news yesterday. The CDC is recommending that parts of the country that have significant or high uh, rates of, of COVID infection um, should mask up, uh, even vaccinated people indoors. And that's just because this Delta variant is so, so contagious um, that even with vaccines, um, there is a risk to some individuals that, that you could get a breakthrough infection. So uh, it's, it's, a, it's something that folks are taking seriously. The White House last night indicated that folks working in the White House will be masking. The U.S. Congress uh, put out a notice. The Office of the Attending Physician um, did so as well. And again, this is not an indication that the vaccines are not working. The vaccines are doing what they spo they're supposed to do, um, but we just need to push more vaccination into that unvaccinated unvac population um, so that we can tamp down on the amount of virus that's circulating in the U.S. Again, vaccination is so, so critical. Um, so then the final slide that I have, 
is about boosters. Uh, and I will say that uh, there's a lot of work going on here. Companies are doing a lot to investigate this. Pfizer put out some new data this morning. Um, the jury is somewhat still out on what doctors and public health officials are gonna recommend. Um, the, these are some of the headlines that, um, that, that are kind of out there that might paint a little bit of a confusing picture for folks on the line. You know, some people are likely going to need boosters at some point, but it's really not yet been said by the FDA or the CDC. Um, the good news about the vaccines is that they do produce um, long-lasting immunity um, and long-lasting protection. Folks are protected for a long time, um, but certain individuals might need a booster. Like, for example, I'm an ER physician. I got my vaccine in December of 2020. As I head into the fall and winter of 2021 and 2022, that's a group of people that folks are talking about maybe needing to give a boost to because we're exposed to a lot of virus. Um, in addition, people that are in nursing homes or maybe people that are immune compromised, uh, that's kind of what we're talking about. And I understand, again, this might get a little confusing, if you get your COVID vaccine today, if you're unvaccinated, you know, thinking about a booster, that is not something you need to think about for a long, long time. That's going to provide you the protection that you need going into the fall and winter of 2021 and 2022. Um, but what we're talking about when we're thinking about with boosters are people that are a little bit further out um, and those that are higher risk. Um, so the jury is still out, but it's an area that a lot of research is going into just to make sure that we can keep people that we want to keep, be protected, which is everyone, of course, uh, make sure we can keep people protected going into the fall and winter of, of this next year. So with that, I know I covered a lot of ground. And there's likely a lot of questions, but I'm excited to be uh, able to share the virtual panel with these two great colleagues. And uh, I'll turn it back to Matt. Okay, thanks, Mike. Great info. And uh, just so everybody's aware, we'll have these slides posted on the IFA website and uh, distributed in a follow-up email after the uh, after the webinar. With that, I will throw it over to Dr. Hilton. Ebony, take it away. Yeah, that was that was a fantastic presentation, Mike. And it, and it's one of those things you said that. Um, a lot of things have, have advanced as far as therapeutics, right, and vaccines that are made available. The other thing that's advanced is actually COVID-19. What we know with this Delta variant is that it's a thousand times more, more contagious than the original COVID-19. Um, but that vaccines, if you're vaccinated, you're 100 times less likely to die if you get infected. And I think that's huge for people to recognize. And in talking of this, you know, this intersection of health and business, I think it's a very great place that we can start talking about these business owners. And we can look back in history of what happens with pandemics. How does it influence your business, right? We saw in 2020, we had not only a health crisis, but a financial crisis for many of you small business owners. And how do we make sure that with this fourth surge that we're now seeing that that doesn't have to be the case for us? Because if we look back in 1918, what we know is that the 1918 pandemic started from 1918 to 1920. And what happened nine years later? Well, the Great Depression, right? Because people were sick. We know at this stage that we have a, a massive amount of persons that have been infected with COVID-19 already prior. And we're seeing where some businesses are struggling having their employees come back to work because those persons are either unfortunately not no longer here or we have an issues of where those persons may be sick or other reasons that are keeping them out of the workforce and it's putting a strain and so what we hope to do in this discussion about vaccines is to say how do we limit the more persons that potential have the potential to be infected with COVID-19 and definitely to prevent and reduce the likelihood of them having those severe complications um, what we're estimating at this point is that by September the 1st we may be looking at 200,000 new cases of COVID-19 a day. And I'm going to say that again. By September 1st, modeling is showing about 200,000 new cases a day. And we reached that number last year around November, December. And we know what the winter months look like for us. So if you can imagine starting that process months prior to in the fall. If we have to address that in the, in the fall and have to address that in the winter, it can put a real strain on Again, our healthcare system, but also on um, individuals like you all that have employees. And so what do we do? We start to talk about the vaccine and the fact that it does, it, it's one of those things, our only real true hope of giving your body that head start, that if you do come into contact with that person who has the Delta variant, that, um, that is a thousand times more contagious, like I said, than the original COVID-19, that your body on day one, already has the blueprint of how do I fight this virus off before it, it overwhelms my system? Because that's what I'm seeing in my ICU. Unfortunately, and across the nation, we're seeing younger and younger persons coming into the hospital 
due to symptomatic COVID. And, and why is that? Well, it's because we did a fantastic job of vaccinating our, our older population, right? We got the 65 and older group. We really hit the, the um, long-term care facilities and nursing homes and really tried to t protect our most vulnerable. But I think that message that of it only being an issue with the most vulnerable people, that it was only old people or only sick people, made people get this, um, this lats or this um, confidence that if I get COVID, nothing will happen to me. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is that, again, it's younger and younger age population that are making up the bulk of persons that are now hospitalized due to COVID. And it's because they are not vaccinated. Um, and there's collateral damage left in the wake of that. If you're thinking about age groups from 20 to 65 years old, and, and really the, the biggest age group is right there around 20 to 45 um, years old, those are persons that have kids at home. And unfortunately, by March of 2021, we had 40,000 new orphans, orphans left behind because their parents unfortunately passed away. Um, it doesn't have to be you. There are, there are several different vaccines now that we have that millions of persons within the United States and then globally, if you add up all those numbers, have shown that this is a safe intervention for you to have. It has shown and proven itself to be effective that it will reduce your likelihood of needing a ventilator, needing to be in the hospital, or like a patient I had last week that was half my age, literally were praying for a lung transplant um, for that person. It's, it doesn't have to be that way. And I really hope in this Q&A session that if people have questions, ask questions, but we need to learn from history. Again, remember 1918, what happened back then, um, and try not to repeat it in this second cycle of what is now end of 2021. Thank you, Dr. Hilton. Uh, a sobering yet um, realistic uh, assessment of where we are. Um, so maybe uh, for the next piece of the conversation, we'll pivot to uh, one of our members that is uh, just one who's doing lots of great things to promote uh, vaccination uh, to the public, to their consumers and to their employees. Uh, so let me bring Jenna into the conversation from McDonald's. Jenna, I will turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much, Matt. Um, I am I'm, I'm sort of I'm fascinated and obsessed with those numbers, uh, Dr. Hilton, that you're sharing there. They're shocking. Um, so I don't know that I have anything as um, shocking and as uh, you know something we can all fixate on as the two doctors have shared, but I do want to share a little bit about what we as a large franchiser um, have you know sort of leaned in into this space along with our franchisees. And I think there's COVID writ large has been a little bit of an example of the best of the power of the franchise system and the franchise model um, because I think it allowed us as a franchisor, a large franchisor with a large brand from the jump to be able to quickly provide resources and guidance to our 2,300 franchisors in the United, franchisees in the United States and their 14,000 restaurants, um, you know, which is the benefit of being a franchisee. You are, and it allowed them throughout the process to make additional decisions that made sense on the ground, but it allowed both a, a center and, you know, to a center and a place for direction and information, and then allowed them to be able to make, um, to make their own decisions. And that it really became an example of the best of franchising. Um, so from the beginning, we at McDonald's, again, corporate, the franchisor in the center, we quickly were able to assess changes that we needed to make or we felt we needed to make in our operating, day-to-day -day operating structures. Um, there were 50 over the course of time changes that we made that are now just really considered commonplace. But back in March and April, of 2020, the notion of um, outfitting our restaurants with protective paneling at the front counter um, and putting our credit card machines on paddles so that there was really no touch, those kind of conversations were, were, were sort of crazy um, in March. But we were able to have those conversations very quickly, make a decision, and frankly, from our perspective, resource quickly. Um, we were just joking yesterday or laughing, sort of, you know, in a, in a, 
kind of terrible way about those back way back in March, Ohio was the first state to require temperature checks, which meant that we had to find a supplier to quickly uh, find a resource for digital thermometers that we could then make available to franchisees, or at least let the franchisees know where they could buy them. Because at the same time, we were looking every human in the United States was looking for a digital thermometer to measure their own potential for fever. So in any case, um, those kinds of things happened quickly. And we were able to say from the center, here are the things that we, you know, we, we require, are going to require as part of the brand. We also then had a series of actions throughout the process that we were able to take as a franchise or and set as a best practice. Franchisees, then we found most of them followed us, but they didn't have to necessarily follow in the way that we, we defined. For instance, we at the corporate level offered um, our corporate employees and our um, restaurant crew four hours of paid leave um, to get their vaccine. We, we provided um, a, 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 you know, a ton of education to our folks that we then made available to our franchisees. There was a website um, for employees that franchisees could make available to their employees. Um, that was their choice. Most of them followed us in those kinds of things, but some of them decided to run their, you know, how they encourage their employees to get vaccinations a little differently than we did. But it was that, again, that model of how can we serve as the center and the guide and the provider of best practices? Um, in some cases, we, you know, as part of the brand, we said these are things you must do in the safety space. But then giving the franchisees the flexibility um, to do their own thing, because obviously we are a big, um, we are a big network. I guess I should say, you know, I work for McDonald's. Perhaps you've heard of us, a little burger company. Um, we have 14,000 restaurants across the United States, so we are in every community. Um, so the actions that we took were very visible. Um, customers expected that we would we would do those things very quickly. Um, and it, you know, what we did at the corporate level and in the um, franchisor space then led the way for you know, 14,000 restaurants across the country, which we think helped lead the way in some cases for, for the industry writ large. So also importantly, um, in addition to paid leave, um, a website that we provided for our employees, we also provided a pod in Chicago um, at our headquarters for our employees um, and frankly for our franchisees who were close by in Chicago. We found that um, many of the franchisees across the country then were looking for creative ways. How could they create a, a network of a thousand employees that they could create a pod for? Um, as it turned out, uh, it was frankly just as easy to use the network of, um, of, of uh, public health clinics and, uh, and um, drugstores to do that. Um, but we also then wanted to use the brand in ways that we felt would both be helpful to the public health effort um, and to our franchisees. So um, for instance, we partnered with the federal government on their We Can Do This campaign. This month, if you get a McCafe at McDonald's, your cup should look like this, um, a We Can Do This cup, um, technically. Uh, these go through our distribution center, which means, I wonder if I can, there we go. Uh, these go through our distribution center, which means these are the cups that get delivered to our franchisees and all of their restaurants this month. Um, technically, a franchisee could decide not to use them. You know, again, this is the model of franchising. Um, we sort of set the, the center, the brand. They have options. But you should be seeing these whenever you get your coffee this month. We also have this same uh, blue logo at it, actually it's a uh, an interactive not interactive but it's a, a television ad that is running on the billboard in Times Square um, on the McDonald's Times Square um, and we have found that not only is that um, you know are we using the brand in a way that we, we said from the get-go again that we wanted to provide information to our employees provide information and guidance to the franchisee network um, but we also wanted to be a source of information for our customers, for our franchisees, for our franchisees' employees. Um, so one of the ways that we could do that was, you know, providing cups and um, letting the community get good information. But we also encouraged our franchisees to do their own kinds of actions. So um, franchisees in California, in um, uh, 
Kentucky have done their own clinics um, and served as a location for community clinics in 100 rural communities, both in California and in Kentucky. Um, more, and we've had lots of um, owner operators who are connecting with, um, with governments, with local governments to say, hey, we have space, we have parking lots, can we be a resource to you? So we have, again, found that model of us setting the tone and in some cases, providing the resource and providing the start and using the brand in a way that is good um, for the company. And then the brand, the owner operators can come behind and do their own thing to amplify. So it is not just one McDonald's headquarters in Chicago doing something. It is one McDonald's headquarters plus 14,000 uh, restaurants owned by 2,300 small businessmen and women across the country doing their own thing. So it again is that amplification, that local on the ground um, decision making backed by the power of our brand and our and our ability to provide information that I think has been so powerful um, to our network and has allowed us to use our network, we hope, um, for good in this process. So that's the McDonald's story in this and I'm happy to join in the uh, question taking extravaganza. Thank you, Jenna. Um, Mike or Ebony, I mean, any any reactions to what McDonald's is doing uh, from where you guys sit in kind of the medical community or the practitioner community and, you know, thoughts about other, you know, ways that corporations, large, small, franchised, otherwise can and should be engaging in, in this, you know, in this effort? I don't know if Mike, you want to take it or not, but... Um... I was going to say, I think it's fantastic. This is public health measures in works, right? Um, the idea that you're supporting your employees too. We know essential workers were hit really hard with this pandemic, um, that they were the most exposed because they are public facing and they were trying to keep us fed, right? And keep our families um, with all the provisions they would need. That being the case, um, to have that set aside time where they can go get vaccinated to show your employees that you actually care about them too. Um, I think that's huge for the morale uh, overall. We know mental health has been a huge issue, um, but also the, the public health measures of keeping the public also safe with the, the plexiglass that you mentioned and the, um, the education pieces that you, you all have, have shared with others. It's those effort i think that would do so much more than what we can do in the hospital because i tell people all the time wellness and health doesn't happen in the hospital people don't come to the hospital because they're healthy they come to the hospital because they're sick which means that health and wellness happens out where you live work play pray right it happens out where you live and the more we can have community um, leaders and community you know, members engage in the process of these public health measures, the less likely that you will end up in our hospital um, in the first place. So I say kudos because I know um, it's not always, this has been a very political um, pandemic, right? And I know it's not always the safest thing to step out on a ledge and say, we wanna put our, our foot on this, um, but we are grateful for it on the healthcare system side because we truly are. Um, we're buckling in many areas to try to keep up with the pace of what this pandemic has, has provided. So, yeah, we thank you. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, those are great points. And I really enjoyed hearing um, from Jenna all the work that's happening with your um, with the McDonald's franchise. And I think, you know, a key point that you made is that franchises are in every community. And at this point in the outreach on um, vaccines, you know, folks that wanted to be vaccinated are already vaccinated. Folks that knew they were going to do it, they found a way. And at this point, we're moving to, you know, sort of the hand to hand outreach. Um, and that's why we need kind of boots on the ground. And that's where you play such an important role. You're in every community. You know, I've moved to, you know, in my ER shifts, I ask every patient if you've, if you, if they've had the vaccine and if they haven't had the vaccine, then I'm spending time with them to try and talk them into doing it. So I just would really encourage the franchises on this call. Don't be afraid to be a resource in your community because you are in the community. You're interacting with folks that are maybe nervous or that haven't been vaccinated or have questions. And uh, I agree with what Dr. Hilton said that that sometimes it's just a little nerve wracking to even ask the question, um, but there's a way to do it that's not political, that's just being a resource and potentially opening the door um, to having a conversation. And don't be dis don't be discouraged if the first answer is no, I have more questions or I wanna wait. Um, it's, you know, eventually you'll get there. Uh, you have to start somewhere. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Uh, Jenny, were you gonna say something? Sorry. I, I was just gonna say that I, I feel like I should be a little transparent in, Mike, your, um, 
your the notion of uh, it can be a tough conversation. I, I want to be a little transparent in the fact that it was a difficult conversation. We don't see this as a political issue, but many people do, and many customers do, and we are we are not in the business of offending our customers. Mm -hmm. um, but we also feel like. Um, you know, we are in the business of, of serving our customers. A lot of that has to do with great customer service. We want our employees and our crew, both of McDonald's and, and of our independent owner operators to be healthy. So it's in our best interest as a business as we get the country back to normal or, you know, sort of out of this phase that have, the more people that get vaccinated, the better. So, you know, while yes, we want to be part of the public health effort and, you know, we want to partner with the White House on that, really at the end of the day, there, there's a business argument for us encouraging people to get vaccinated. So it was, you know, there, there was, these were tough conversations, but we do see ourselves strictly, this is not political, it's strictly about providing information, being a resource, because it is the path back to a place where we can ensure that that our employees can stay safe and healthy, that we have enough employees who can come to work who are not sick. Um, it, there is a little bit of, um, you know, a little bit of self-preservation in it for us, um, in addition to being that community resource. But um, I do, you know, it is worth noting that it, it wasn't necessarily, and it still isn't an easy conversa conversation uh, for a lot of customers. And frankly, for some of the, you know, for some of the owners of McDonald's in places where the vac vaccination rates are low. Yep. I was going to make mention, um, because I, I can appreciate that a business is a business, right? And, and we do have to recognize the bottom dollar on our on our healthcare system. We are a business too. So, um, you know, it is what it is. But it's it's one of those things. That's why I lead with this discussion of this um, great partnership. We're talking about health and the business sector overlap. Because if you're looking again with the 1918 pandemic, that could be a historic um, reasons as to why franchisees may want to start thinking about vaccination rates and how to improve it in their community. But there was a report by Fair Health that they looked at 2 million persons um, who were infected with COVID-19. And one of my big messages is always, death is not the only consequence of COVID, right? We have to think also about long COVID because we're seeing more and more studies like out of Stanford of where persons who say I just had my um, loss of my taste and smell we know that means it infected your brain and what does that do what are the long-term consequences of that inflammatory process of your brain what is it linked to and unfortunately out of Stanford what we're finding is that um, my garbage truck just decided to come but <laughs> what, what we're finding is that um, there is a, a structural change that resembles that of Alzheimer's or Parkinson's right in those patients who unfortunately passed away from COVID-19, their brain structure is starting to look like that. So out of the Fair Health Report of 2 million people, what they found was that 23% of those 2 million people complained of lingering symptoms for 30 days or more, right? If you think about that with your essential um, workers, if we know that they're the most likely to be infected, what percentage of them, if studies over and over are saying 10 to 30 percent of them would develop these long COVID symptoms, especially if they get that severe reaction from COVID-19, then we may greatly impact your workforce. And in a business, your bottom dollar literally is tied to your employees being able to show up to perform, right? So it, it becomes one of these things where you think about your business plan, and I'm not a business plan kind of person. I don't know how you guys create that. Um, but when you're thinking about that, you have to know that Healthy, healthy workers is what keeps your your business um, fertile or, or, or fruitful, I guess. Well, and on that point, I mean, people tend to think of franchising mostly in the restaurant sector, and we've had so many other sectors that have done tremendous things. And um, just on the health and wellness side, I mean, the that the fitness industry is one of the biggest sectors in franchising that's really leaned in, not only on you know getting fit, staying healthy, being active as one of the best things that you can do, you know, separate and apart from getting the vaccine uh, and wearing a mask uh, to staying healthy and being a healthy person helps you prevent disease. So they've been really leaning into that message as part of, you know, getting their businesses reopened as well as educating the public about the health and benefits of being fit and healthy. 
Um, and then, you know, I'd be remiss, remiss if I didn't mention some of our other sectors and franchising, like the hospitality sector that's doing amazing things, um, hosting essential workers and test sites and vaccine sites um, uh, around the country, um, as well as many others. So I um, have a couple of questions uh, came in on the chat um, in, our, in our last little bit here. Um, one uh, question is, uh, what's the main difference between a person who is vaccinated to a person who's already had the virus previously and wouldn't that produce the same or better result uh, as the vaccine via the antibodies um mike maybe that um is a question for for you i think we're in vehement disagree i think uh, dr hill and i are in vehement agreement that um the vaccines actually provide a super superhuman level of response is the best way to thinking about it best way to think about it. It it you um I think most of the studies are now indicating that um you know vaccinations are 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 uh you know better than a natural infection, particularly a mild natural infection, definitely than an asymptomatic um, natural infection. So that's why the CDC recommends even people that have recovered from COVID-19 should get the full vaccine series. Um, and that means two shots of uh, Pfizer or Moderna or one shot of J&J. Um, so it's really important, even if you've recovered from COVID-19, that you've got the vaccine and you complete the series. Even more important with the Delta variant, because it's so contagious, the reinfection that can occur in people that have had natural infections, so meaning you had the original wild type strain or the alpha variant in 2020, um, the risk of getting reinfected is definitely present. So it's important to get the vaccine, even if you've recovered. Thanks, Mike. Um, so this one, maybe for the group, if every franchisee would require their employees to get vaccinated, would it have a positive impact on new COVID cases? I think the obvious answer is yes. Um, but, you know, there's this requirement aspect um, and it's sort of an increasing trend towards at least governments. And I know there's major debate within the White House and the Biden administration on requirements for government employees. But um, you know, maybe curious your thoughts, Mike and Ebony, on that, and then you know, Jenna, to the extent that's been discussed uh, with the McDonald's, if you can offer any thoughts, that'd be great. You know, only thing I would say is that um, you know, globally, only 14% of the globe has been fully vaccinated. Keep that in mind when we're talking about variants. You can't talk about variants without talking about the unvaccinated population, right? So we have the Delta variant that we are now facing. But that's not the same. We have the Lambda now that just actually um, has been discovered. I think the first case was actually in Texas um, in the United States. But we know that we have potential for other variants to come across. And this is why, again, when, when we're talking about the impact that it can potentially have on franchises and small um, small business owners, is that if you if we if we don't have these persons within your your community um, vaccinated. We can look at even what happened in Provincetown, of where there was a high level of vaccination, but because of the Delta variant and because of how contagious it was, they had a little mini outbreak, right? Now, gratefully, in Provincetown, um, they, the persons that ended up being infected because they had the vaccine, they didn't get those severe cases of, of having to be hospitalized, having to be um, with a ventilator, unfortunately, um, not having the, the issue with death, but it is still a threat. So. It's, I don't think of it as a political move. I literally think of it as a way of how do we protect not only your employees, but every customer that's walking into your establishment. Because if you have to report that we've had an outbreak um, in, in this facility, what does that do for the longevity, right? Will people be afraid to come in? Um, will, they, will they hesitate to do business there? But it's also just protecting the people that you have invested your, your time and your energy into because we know that these this variants, the the UK variant, was um, you know a little bit more contagious than the original um, COVID-19. The South African variant showed us that it was kind of contagious and that it could evade the immune system. And the Delta variant has said, "Let me get two of those and let me be more contagious and let me also be able to evade the immune system a little bit better." We don't have time. Um, on our side when it comes to COVID-19. The longer we wait to get ourselves protected, um, the more likely we're gonna be facing an even greater threat than we had in 2020, just because now the sheer number um, of variants that we have kind of in our circulation that are more contagious and unfortunately with more serious consequences than the original COVID-19. Thanks, Ebony. Mike, any any additional thoughts to add on that question? 
Yeah, I think um, it's sort of an all of the above approach. You know, whatever you know, whatever we need to to do to to increase uh, vaccination rates is something that I I think you know is 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 the approach that a lot of folks are are looking at. You know, the the I think we can't lose sight of the fact that the vaccine you know is something that you know even with all of these questions about variants and, and boosters and all that like just you know focusing on the mere the the key fact that it protects you from getting really sick and ending up in the hospital like that's the thing that's most important to focus on um and even with kind of the the uncertainty of the future i think like let's let's go with what we know which is that it provides this incredible uh, protection um and and it's been studied so widely it's been used by billions of people around the world at this point um so i think we just have to kind of reinforce those key messages that the safety the efficacy uh and the fact that it's been so widely used um and, and really start there thanks mike jenna anything to add um, I would add just, I mean, I, I'm sure that our experience at both the corporate level and I can't speak directly for the franchisees, but I, I can tell you, I know they're having similar conversations, you know, is very difficult. Um, there are legal implications. There are, you know, all of, you know, requirement, there's HIPAA, there's all of these kinds of discussions on the requirement piece. Um, I think, um, I know at the moment, you know, we have landed at the focus being on doing as much as we can to encourage, um, again, and make easy, provide easy access. We sort of established some principles uh, from the center early, early on that we were going to advocate for our frontline workers. Um, uh, Dr. Hilton, to your point, you know, those essential workers, we were going to be an advocate for those people going as early in the process as they could, and, and we did that, that we would provide information to our employees, to franchisees, to the community, um, and that we would, we would remove as many barriers as we could to vaccination. Um, and, you know, and then we are planning as people are coming back to work, um, what are the, you know, what are the measures we are putting in place? If you're, you know, if you, we have a, still have a daily screen um, that asks about, you know, have you been, have you been vaccinated? Um, mostly we are using that to track our numbers. Um, we're not, again, we don't require it, but we are then, um, you know, we are looking at things like, um, can we, you know, we require masks still for if you're not vaccinated. Um, I just noticed the cruise industry, um, you know, is having this really difficult conversation about, you know, if you're not vaccinated, there's whole different like levels of the ship that you can be on and you have to wear your mask. So these are really difficult conversations. Um, and frankly, I think as the Delta vaccine, or excuse me, as the Delta variant continues to unfortunately gather steam, I think a lot of companies are going to have to go back to this question of, do we maybe need to go further? Um, should we think about it? And especially as the vaccines come into their um, you two could tell me what the what the official language is around their their formal official long term approval from the CDC. Um, does that change the game at all? So I think it, it is a very hard conversation. We've had lots of conversations about it and are beginning to have them. Um, just sort of again, what are the things that we might need to do differently writ large um, now as we've gone into the into this Delta space? But again, we too have focused on uh, and and any and all approach to how do we make it easy, make it attractive, and encourage people to go there. Yeah, that's well said. What, what have you guys seen on incentives that work or that don't work from employers or um, to customers? I know, you know we've had a lot of conversations about the role that, that the association could play. We ultimately set that aside due to lots of factors. Um, but, um, I'm not sure that's in the mix with McDonald's, but I know others um, have done incentives for um, getting the vaccine. Like I know Uber and Lyft are doing things um, as right, well as right. traditional retailers. Anything to offer there? I don't know that I, I mean, I know that I can't tell you exactly what our numbers look like. Um, but, you know, and I can't tell you what our numbers look like um, from our franchise perspective in terms of how many of, you know, a given franchisee's employees are vaccinated. But I can tell you that, meaning I can't speak to the uptake and what is most effective. 
what I can tell you is that the owners, um, you know, we again offered four hours of paid leave. We put a clinic on site. Again, how can we remove the barriers? Um, owners, we saw owners across the country doing the same thing, offering gift cards, um, offering to provide a ride um, from the workplace to a clinic, um, offering, you know, a, a Visa card to buy dinner someplace. We, you know, really anything that might get people you know excited we did find that the with with so many people and i'm guessing this is probably true of the rest of the country the first phase for us was making it easy and people who wanted the vaccine took advantage of all the ways that it was easier um and you know we we're frontline workers and we had a lot of people take advantage of those how do you make it easier kinds of options whether that was owner operators providing a free ride or um, you know providing a, a an on-site clinic as it's gotten as you know as I think Mike as you had said as we've gotten into the space where now we have people who don't want to get vaccinated and now you're in a mind change situation um, I think that then has you know that is we're experiencing the same difficulties that everybody from the nfl on down is experiencing who is the right messenger to help convince someone um, that they should they should get the vaccine we think we have a role to play in that in that sometimes we're you know trusted you know at least to say here here's some information um, and you know we can serve as a community center. I know that our owner operators have, some of them have hosted coffees in the restaurant where a community organization is coming in to you know talk about the vaccine. It's, I don't know that I can speak to what works best, but I can tell you this is also an any and kind of proposition or it has been for us, at least in the, in the employee space. How do, we, how do we really push employees to get vaccinated? Yeah, I think that's- Yeah, I'll go ahead. No, no, go for it, please. I was just gonna say one incentive I heard of is um, there were people who were hesitant to get vaccinated because they thought if I am one of those persons that afterwards the natural immune response is that you have the fever, you may feel um, that you're because of the way your immune system is ramped up, you may have the fevers, the chills, the aches for 24 hours, and they were nervous that if I get vaccinated, I will miss work right so um one of the things that this this local business around town is that they gave um their employees permission that if you have to miss the next day we we won't it won't be penalized against you basically and i don't know what they call it i don't know if that's pto again i'm not in that area <laughs> sector but that's what i know they did for the um for their their employees is to grant that grace period that if after you get the vaccination if you need that 24 hour the next day that's fine. Um, and then come back to work because we know you're trying to do what's best for not only your health, the general public, but also the well-being of our company. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think the the issue is 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 as as both were saying, like if, if there were a simple solution, then we would have done it by now. So it's that kind of fact that we're in the hand to hand combat. I think we got an information share about what's working for different situations and sort of like continue to brainstorm um, and continue to to share good ideas because it might work for a handful of your employees, it might work for a handful of my patients, and then it might not work for the next group patients and employees um, and so continuing to dialogue about you know what's working in in various communities is important that's why it's great that we're having this forum to almost you know throw out throw out new ideas well one more question in our remaining minutes here from the from the chat um, it, it has to do with uh, probably a mic question uh, how does the vaccine protect you from other variants that come about um, for instance if you were vaccinated in late 2020 before Delta Mm -hmm. um, how was the vaccine able to incorporate creating antibodies to fight off those types of variants? Yeah, totally. So that's a great question. And it's kind of speaks to the to the complexity of the immune system. And the immune system is not just kind of like, you know, antibodies are not the only thing that you make to, to provide you protection, but they are an important front line. Um, so if you think about, you know, like, uh, you know, if you think about sports, or if you think about like battle, antibodies are the front line. Um, they're the ones that are going to protect you from sort of getting any symptomatic infection. Um, but you have other immune system cells like T cells and B cells, and those provide you with that broad kind of longer term protection um, and, and provide you from getting really sick and ending up in the hospital. And those, those are sorts of things that will be with you and provide you protection, ideally against future variants. The issue that we're dealing with now with breakthrough infections is that those 
kind of frontline antibody levels, they do seem to decline over time. Um, and they do seem to be more effective against the wild type, the original coronavirus strain than some of the newer variants. So it's not that the vaccines, again, it's not that they're not effective, it's just that it's a different aspect of the immune system working. Um, so you still have protection, it's just whether or not it's that kind of really strong frontline. And that's what a lot of the science community is trying to figure out right now. What changes would we need to make? Um, and the, the question of do we need to adjust the vaccine is one question, or do we need to boost the vaccine? Do we need to do neither? Do we need to do both? Um, and I just hope that folks on the line, you know, are aware that our companies are actively researching it. There are clinical trials going on now. There are lab studies going on now. They're working with regulators to try and come up with answers to those questions. Um, honestly, every day new data comes out and uh, I think more guidance will come. And uh, the best thing you can do right now, again, is to get vaccinated with the vaccines that are authorized because it is going to provide you with that really broad protection and, and get the hospital from getting really sick. Thanks, Mike. Um, well, I think we'll leave it there. Um, I want to really thank Pharma for helping uh, bring this conversation together. Uh, Mike, you and your team uh, over at the association and everything you do in the medical community as well in your second job. Uh, Ebony, thank you so much for your thoughts and your expertise uh, and your first uh, firsthand experience dealing with uh, this in the real world. And Jenna, thank you to you, all you and McDonald's do to support the IFA and all the work company and your franchisees are doing uh, to fight the virus. So with that, um, we will wrap things up. As I mentioned, uh, the webinar and the slide deck Mike presented will be available on the IFA's community website, uh, community.franchise.org, and everybody who RSVP'd will get an emailed copy of that after we wrap up here. So thanks for joining us today and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.